House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and I'm at the controls, Al Warren, and uh, co-hosting uh, from the East Coast today is our, <laughs> is our reporter on the street, uh, <laughs> David North Martino. How are you doing, Dave? I'm great, Al. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you really don't sound like you're from Boston. I know, right? Why? I've been hiding everything. Smoking, <laughs> it's all smoke and mirrors. All... <laughs> <laughs> there is no Boston. It's a conspiracy. It is. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Well, the flat earthers, you see how it's not. There is no Australia. Well, that's true. Right? They said there's no such thing. So anybody you've ever <laughs> met from Australia is not an Australian. They're in on it. They are. They are. Just so, so be aware. Next time you're out shopping and you hear an Australian accent, <laughs> be aware that they're part of the big plan. <laughs> I will keep that in mind. I don't know what kind of plan that is. but I, I don't know either. But keep your eye out. Follow them. <laughs> Report on them. And I let will. Us, let us know. We'll break in. If we have, have a, a yeah, late-breaking report. Yeah, yeah, but don't, don't make yourself obvious. Okay? I won't. Yeah. <laughs> Pretend you're Australian. No, you can't even sound like you're from Boston. That's not going to be good. <laughs> good day. Yeah. Oh, no, no. No, okay. it didn't work. Just, just don't. Say nothing. No, no. Well, today we are um, in the world of writing, and we are going to go a little inside writing with an international best-selling author. So on the line, we've got V.S. Holmes. Thank you for being here, V.S. Holmes. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. Well, we'll see if you say that at the end of the show. <laughs> I, 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 too, am from the East Coast, so I... You know. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Well, you have to be careful. Which doesn't exist. Yeah, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. You're all in on the conspiracy. The world is flat. There is no moon. <laughs> It's all fake. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, well, you know, but, but that brings up, you know, when I talk about that, I laugh because, uh, you know, we had the flat earthers on, and that's sort of why I do that. But, <laughs> well, they, then they're really into it, you know. They, they're, they're great. Uh, but um, you kind of write in a, in a fantasy sort of fiction, don't you, in a sense? So, I mean, what do you consider yourself? What kind of writer would you call yourself if someone asked Frantic. No. Um, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I, I write sci-fi fantasy, um, and sort of the more literary term, what I guess, would be speculative fiction, um, depending on, on how um, snotty you want to sound. That's, that's not fair, but... Um. <laughs> you know, well, I was, no, but I was asked that. You know, it was funny because um, we were doing an interview um, with someone that said they were speculative um, fiction, and I know the co-host who was from the UK at the time. She said, "What's that? What does yeah. that mean?" And I, and I really didn't know how to answer. I, I don't know what that means. I guess it's highbrow, but what is speculative anything? Is it just what does that mean when they say that? I think I mean the the way I use it is sort of as a bit more of a, an umbrella term for the world that you're. Crafting, you know, if, if it's a, a different planet or a completely different universe from ours or fantasy universe, you know, or, or, or sci-fi. But also, it, it also incorporates the stories that we write that are a little bit maybe quieter. Um, you know, a, a lot of fabulism or um, magical realism, I think, can also go under that umbrella. So it's, it's just a little bit broader. And it's easier than, you know, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, you know, <laughs> you know say, saying all these things. Um, so, but I, I do think that there is a bit of a highbrow um, history to the term, for sure. Yeah. So, so uh, are flat earthers um, writing a book? Um, that would sort of be in that area? I mean, I guess it depends on if you're asking them or, or asking Right, them. right. They're, they're, for them, it's, <laughs> it's true crime, actually, for right. them, because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's planned, right? But uh, I, So this must be a great category to be in as a I writer. Uh, well, and especially these days, because, you know, there, there are so many conspiratorial thinkers out there. There's so many people doing these 
you know, the Jewish laser beams and all this <laughs> stuff's going on right now and the fake, fake snow in Texas. It, it, oh, yeah. You know, all this. So with that kind of thinking, um, it must be a good uh, thing to be in. I mean, yes and no. It's they're, they're stealing all our ideas, and <laughs> it's, it, it's a little difficult too, because you know the, the whole fact is is stranger than fiction thing. You know, if, if I were writing half the stuff that's happening in the world, you know, I'd, I'd be laughed at it, it, it. You know, this this isn't realistic. Which I I always think it's funny when someone makes that argument with sci-fi and fantasy, because it's like, well, but dragons though, guys. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of funny because I I couldn't write this and and not be laughed at. Um, but it is, you know, there, there's a lot of um, fuel, and at least now we can write whatever ridiculous stuff we want and know, well, it, it, it actually could happen, though. <laughs> Does it ever worry you that s some of these people would latch on to you and some of your stories and kind of go, wow, <laughs> 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 this, this is happening, you know, um, it, that they, they start following you because they think, oh, this like I'm, is, I'm preaching. Yeah, like like you know something. You're part of the you're part of the conspiracy. Maybe maybe you're in on it. And uh, but but you ever think that because a lot of what people say, like when you go back in time, I, I find this fascinating because when we go back to things like look at Dracula. Dracula was a complete fiction, but look how real people have made it. How how mm -hmm. humans now go around pretending or thinking they're vampires and drinking each other's bloods and doing all sorts of so so but that completely come from a fictional mind it wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't something that was going on that people heard in the news and decided well i'm going to do that so pe people people actually have bought into i'm a vampire you know oh no kidding i, I mean i I might have dated one of those, yeah. but um, <laughs> <laughs> you made it out alive. So <laughs> <laughs> until I figured it out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I think it would be interesting. I of course I'd be a little flattered. I think if if someone were to latch on, but one of I mean, in so far as my my science fiction goes, you know, I, I have a disclaimer at the front of the book that says, you know, I don't actually believe in ancient aliens, and I don't think that aliens have anything to do with anything that humans have built. You know, we're, we're quite capable. Um, and I, I think part of that is not just so that if, like, my coworkers read it, you know, they, they think I'm a loon, but also because I, I don't want to perpetuate some of those things because, well, I mean, a lot of it can be kind of funny on, on the surface, um, you know, there are some nasty roots to a lot of those those beliefs, and so I sort of try and temper it. Um, but, you know, if, if someone's not hurting anyone, I'm like, sure, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I don't think any, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, as these stories go over the years and generations, um, the newer people that follow in don't have the evil intention or thought behind the original idea. Right. So it's, you know, for them it's totally... Um, they jump in and go, yeah, this is this is it. You know, they they, they get into it and that, but it's kind of, I don't know. I think the whole thing's crazy, but um, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, I, but maybe I'm crazy and everyone else is sane, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess it's all, all a matter of perspective. Well, exactly. So, how did you decide that you wanted to be a writer, and and especially in Kind of this speculative or sci-fi fantasy area. How did, how did it, how did it start for you? I mean, I've, I've always been drawn to storytelling, and I I was an only child, and I grew up in the woods, so there there wasn't a whole lot of um, human interaction for for me to, you know. You, did you stay yeah. at grandma's house? Three little bears, or <laughs> <laughs> essentially, and my, my my parents would just let me wander off into the woods, and you know they kept binoculars by the sink to make sure they could still see me bobbing around out there. Um, but you know, I was, I, I was alone a lot of the time. And so I had a lot of imagination to keep myself company and that kind of naturally, uh, transferred into storytelling. Um, as you know, as, as I got older, uh, though, you know, we, we won't talk about the first forays into writing that I, <laughs> that I did. That's, they don't need to ever see the light of day, no. but, um, you know, I, I did that. And then, you know, I also, I, 
read a lot as a kid, and a lot of what I was drawn to were the science fiction and fantasy stories. You know, my, my dad read me The Hobbit when I was really little, and though TV wasn't really a thing in my house, um, the movies that, that I was allowed to watch were, you know, like the, the Nature Show and Cosmos and Contact and things like that. Um, my, my dad was a sci-fi fan, so I sort of naturally came to those those worlds, um, you know, as, as I was consuming things. And then it just, that's just where I went when I decided to actually sit down and take writing, you know, professionally um, in at the end of my university career. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was just, I, I wanted to make worlds. You know, I, I think a lot of speculative fiction is dreaming about the worlds we want ours to become or, Maybe the the worlds we, we fear ours will become, um, depending on on how, how dark you get there. Yeah. And you know, I I wasn't happy with where my world was, so I, I wanted to make a new one, and, and that kind of became my the the, the various worlds that I've created. Though hmm. I definitely think they're they're darker. <laughs> oh well, so but but so in a way, it's an escape. Yes. In, 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 it, it's both an escape and also a, um, a road map, I think. But when, okay, so when, you, when, you're, when you're a sci-fi writer, now get this, because I'm, I'm nonfiction and all that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. so I, I, don't, I don't do this sort of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you actually are looking for a better world or a darker mm-hmm. world or just a different world, whatever way you want to go, uh, as a sci-fi writer, doesn't that make you expose kind of some of your own feelings? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I especially just the past few few years. Um, you know, I've, I, I mean, as as everyone has, you know, there's there's been a lot going on in the world and a lot to um, deal with. And I was just talking to one of my my other friends recently about. I feel like I just like ripped open my chest with a lot of the stuff I've been writing over the past two years, and now there's just literary blood, like, everywhere. <laughs> I have to try and, you know, clean, clean up the mess. You better clean up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up to try. Um, but it, it, definitely, I think, you know, I, at first, you know, my, my first few books, I was a bit more reserved with how much of my emotions I was putting into it. You know, they're, they're real, and, like, you know, we, we put a bit of ourselves into all of our characters, but... Um, you know, I, I, to a lesser extent with those early ones, because I, you know, I either wasn't sure if I could go there or if I was comfortable going there just, just as a person. Um, and I, I, you know, I think my writing has improved as I've allowed myself to, to go there and go there with my readers too, um, in, in, in a lot of ways. But yeah, it, it gets, it can get a little emotional. <laughs> But then, but then, you see, this is kind of a point where um, I've learned to do this over 20 books, so I, I can put myself out there more so now. But in a true crime or a, a cult book, I, I don't have to, like, let's say, a fiction writer, and especially like what you're saying. So when you expose your feelings and expose how, how you're kind of exposing kind of how you think and how you live, does that that so for me that takes a lot of courage so do you ever worry about that or do you ever worry what you can talk about in a book or what you can express in 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 some of these stories as compared to um you know someone like me like do you ever worry that i don't know maybe with social media and everything or mm. does it like how do you deal with that um, well, I mean, it's it, it's complicated. So in in some ways, you know, I I have a shield that you don't because you write nonfiction, and I can just say it's the character. I can say it's it's not real. Um, you know, I I don't, um, but I could, and you know, I, I don't really believe in separating the art from the artist because it, it it does come from somewhere. You know, even if it's accidental. Um, but in in a lot of ways. I feel like I can be more honest with my fiction because it's the only place I, I really can be and be safe about it because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty online person with, like, the capital O or whatever. Um, 
you know, I, I have all the various social medias and I'm, I'm also a, a queer person. And so I'm, I'm out online and I, I try to be, you know, out to some extent in, in my daily life, but it's not really possible. And so when someone encounters my feelings in my books, you know, that's, for me, that's safer than when someone just encounters me existing as a person on the street. Um, you know, it, it, you're less likely to get uh, actually actually harmed, you know, when, when you're writing fiction in in a lot of ways. But I do, you know, I, I do get... Um, I do get backlash because of the characters I write. You know, I, I write queer characters, I write disabled characters. And I, I do get backlash, but I I think it's worth the good that it does, and it's worth connecting with people who can actually see themselves in my work, maybe for the first time in a long time or the for, for the first time ever. Um, that's To me, that's, that's worth the danger. So are your characters coming from a real person or a real place I mean obviously you're sharing some of your own experience and that's how you can express yourself right um, but mm -hmm. where do your characters in your stories come from God I don't know <laughs> <laughs> no, they, um, you know they they kind of they, they don't spring fully formed from my brain you know that's that's not a thing for me um, I think every author is different but for me most of my stories have started with just a, a single scene will kind of pop into my head, like, oh, that's fun, you know, daydream. And then I'll start asking myself questions about that character. And, you know, like, why why is this archaeologist so ticked off about their site being vandalized? You know, like, is, is it just because it was vandalized? Well, who, well, who vandalized it? Um, you know, that, that kind of thing. And as, as I ask myself those questions, who that character is kind of... Um, Come, comes forth, and of course I, I try to not always write the same character, um, and and each of them has a different part of who I am, I think, in in them. Um, some, you know, it's more superficial, and some it's, you know, maybe no one would notice that they have a part of me in them. Um, hmm. So are you, do, but do you dig for people, like do you, you know, if you're out in the <laughs> store and and then someone's in the lineup, or if you're at a coffee shop, or even at work, and something like that, does that kind of give you ideas for characters? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, p people watching is fantastic. Um, but I, I also, I, I sort of had to chuckle when you said dig. Um, my, <laughs> my day job is as an archaeologist, and <laughs> we travel to all these different, you know, usually fairly rural areas, but also, you know, sometimes we're working in cities. We travel to all these really cool places, and there's some incredibly colorful characters that we work with, um, that or you know wish wish we didn't work with, depending on on who they are. And you know, I again, like the whole fact is stranger than fiction. Half the people I have to tone them down because people wouldn't believe the the type of of human that I encounter. Um, so I definitely have a lot of inspiration from that as well. Just some really really cool people and really cool places that I've been. Have you ever had a character surprise you? Oh yeah. With what they've done. <laughs> <laughs> one of my one of my favorites. And like I I don't really subscribe to the whole like they're actually talking to me, I can't control them thing. Um that, that's just sort of not not how I look at my writing. But I have had, I guess Inspiration strike in a way that really surprised me, um, particularly with my character Bren from my epic fantasy series. And initially, I was writing him to show the enemies side of things. You know, the, the quote bad guys. Though I, I try not to write good guys and bad guys; they're all sort of morally gray. Um, but he he was just supposed to be this this bad guy, and then um, I started writing him, and he turned into one of the three main characters and he had this deep connection with one of the other characters that I hadn't really planned on. And I mean, I had to trash like the whole, my second half of the book that I'd already written. Um, but yeah, he, he really surprised me for sure. And I've, I've had a lot of side characters sort of surprise me in ways that um, are, are really fun. I think that's one of my favorite parts of the writing process when I'm still in that discovery mode. You know that's that's really weird. Uh, 
because like Dave writes kind of like your your style of writing and he hears voices in his head completely <laughs> insane and not ever be in a room alone with him um, well you know the thing is I I can't really listen to like music with lots of um, lots of rhythm and lots of lyrics it kind of drowns out that that uh, I don't know the the, the uh, or the voices in my head, but you know just the uh, the, the rhythm of the uh, of the language. Yeah. Now, and, do okay. you? No, this is this is sort of a tangent. And I apologize for that, but uh, I remember there was a thing going around the internet about people who actually like have the inner monologue, like words, and then mm-hmm. people who just think in like visual concepts. And I wonder if that's where that's coming from. Or are, are you a, an inner monologue person? I am. Yeah, see, I'm not. I'm, ah. I'm. It's just all concepts and images. There's, there's no words. Okay. So I, I also that's don't listen to a lot of lyrics when I, when I write, but I do listen to a lot of instrumental music. So that's. I, I wonder if that's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably like the, the witch we interviewed earlier this week. That um, everything is visual. Mm. Remember, mm. she said everything was. Yeah. All put in her head. It was all pictures yeah. and, and stuff. Yeah. Um, nothing no words so and then that that leads me to the next question of of mm-hmm. um in is, is with that being the case how what do you consider your characters like the characters you've written how do you feel about them oh like like just as people or like yeah we see this, <laughs> yeah i know i know we well, see cuz this is really insane for a non-fiction writer right cuz we've mm-hmm. been we've been interviewing five a week for a long time and and i get a lot of well they're like my kids they're like me you know you get all these um family and emotional ties to the characters and i'm thinking well this is completely insane i see i'm not i'm not like that i i definitely i have characters who mean a lot to me um not necessarily the ones that you might think um Especially like when it comes to ones. main characters. Well, I mean, some of them, some of them, yeah, but others are they're they're fine. Um, you know, they they serve their purpose for the plot. But I, there are a few that, like, you know, I I, I would defend them with my life kind of deal. But um, you know, it's it's much more. I, th- I think I have a lot more distance between myself and them when it comes to like, like I know I created them. I know that I can, I can also just just write them out if if i needed to um you know assuming the book isn't published yet um but to me i think my connection to my characters is much deeper insofar as how readers are connecting to them you know if if someone writes me and says oh my god like i i saw myself in nell and the way she deals with her anger is is just so powerful to me you know that that means more to me than simply writing a scene where she loses her temper or 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 anything like that um i do love them you know and and i i will get like ticked off if if someone um is saying something nasty about them for you know non like constructive critical reasons (laughs) well none of that goes on (laughs) no (laughs) no. nobody nobody does that no no Everyone's just perfectly. Um, well, you know, but do, so do you ever kill off people that you hate? <laughs> I, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> Come on. no, because I asked this because one of the very first fiction writers I ever had on the show was J.D. Horn, and he was he's like a New York Times bestseller. And I said that to him, and he said, "Yeah, actually, if there's someone in the lineup." That was his example. That would be rude or push, cut in front of him or something. He takes that character, and when he needs someone to kill, that's who he kills. <laughs> <laughs> I I tend to to kill the ones that that I really like. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> not not always. There's there's one that I really enjoy that I like. I know someone was saying like, "Can he please die? He's a monster. He's a total jerk. Can he please die." And I'm like. <laughs> no, he stays forever. Um, but I, <laughs> I think for me, it's it's a bit more. Um, you know, I'll I'll maybe write in a few side characters, but it's it's more like if if I meet someone who's a jerk in real life, I I might um, take inspiration from them. But I don't usually kill them off. There there are a lot of bodies in my books, but um, 
I, I try to pull the heartstrings with them more than the, you know, oh, yeah, that guy's finally dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the, so that, that would be an interesting story. Your characters control you. Yeah, well, the, the question that a lot of people ask is like, oh, who would you want to sit down with over coffee? Like, what, what, which of your characters? And it's like, they'd poison my coffee. Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wouldn't want to. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, yeah, and don't take a, a drink from Dave, Dave either. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, the, he's hearing these voices. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know. um, wow. So what is the most important part of... Um, sci-fi fantasy writing for me it's yeah. it's making the the worlds we want to see it's it's weaving the hope into the darkness you know I, I love making these really dark difficult worlds and then showing that we can still find a place for ourselves in them and find a way to get out of it um you know i I think a lot of us turn to fiction because it's it's easier to find solutions to our problems there because we're not really looking for them um and i i try and incorporate that into my into my work but i i really think the the most impactful books i've read have been speculative you know whether it's sci-fi or fantasy because i wasn't expecting that that roadmap or that helping hand and to me i think that that means the most do you have an underlying subtext in the story, is there something you want people to take away from the book besides um, the the world you created? Definitely. I mean, it, it varies from project to project, and I don't always know what it is, I think, when I first set out. Um, I Maybe about halfway through, two-thirds two of the way through um, my, my process, I'll kind of distill what I'm, like, what, what the heck my point is, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> And usually it's, it has to do with the connection to each other and the connection through the past and to the future um, of, of where we're going, where we're coming from. And there's, you know, a lot of cyclical, um, you know, themes, death themes, things like that. Um, it, it, sort of going back to my work as an archaeologist, you know, looking at the past and looking at the future and how those things aren't really distinct from one another. So when you get to the right, now, now your newest book coming out is called <laughs> Heretics. Yes. Um, what's the premise of this book? So it's, it's the fourth in my sci-fi series, which is the Star's Edge Nell Bentley books. And um, the, the series as a whole follows um, Dr. Nell Bentley, who is a foul-mouthed, foul-tempered archaeologist. And um, in the first book, she discovers that her, like, pristine career-making dig site is actually the center of an intergalactic feud. And she's thrust into this high-tech, higher-stakes kind of world. Um, and so the, the books follow her as she comes into contact with a lot of uh, a lot of things she wasn't prepared to believe in and still, frankly, would rather she didn't. <laughs> um, and, and book four... She's actually returning to Earth um, from being not on Earth <laughs> in the previous book. And um, she and her on-again, off-again girlfriend, Lynn, are tracking this killer sound wave, um, hoping to get ahead of it before it actually destroys Earth the way it destroyed the planet that they were um, excavating in the previous book. Well, Earth isn't that great anyway. <laughs> I did. I, I did incorporate a little bit of the pandemic into into it, but it's like a footnote. <laughs> oh, really? So, so you haven't shied away from from the pandemic thing going on? Not. I mean, I I've I mentioned it. You know, it, it takes place um, technically a couple years in the future. Um, I, I don't really set a hard year. Um, just to give myself some some wiggle room. And there's there's been some multiple year long cryo sleep trips that they've gone on to. Um, but, yeah, I, I wanted to, to mention it because she comes back to Earth and she's really excited to be home and she hasn't been there in a really long time. And she sees all these stickers saying, you know, keep keep your distance, keep two meters apart and, um, you know, wear, wear your masks. And it's just such an apocalyptic thing to see even in my own world that I wanted to incorporate that sense of, like, this isn't the world that I left. Um, 
So I think as, as a lot of us return to some of our more normal behaviors, um, as, as it's safe to do so, I think there's going to be a lot of that feeling. So do you have anti-maskers and that in your book, too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they actually have a vaccine. Um, <laughs> By I mean, Bill Gates? <laughs> well, that's, that, <laughs> that's the thing. Um, the, the organization that she's is sort of grudgingly working for um, developed one, and that was their big reveal, like, by the way, we kind of have our fingers in a lot of in a lot of pies, and uh, we have this great vaccine, and isn't it wonderful? Haven't we saved you all? Um, we might actually control the world. <laughs> mm, yeah. So there's there, there's some undercurrents there. Um, yeah, George Soros. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I got it now. A description in for your book, and it's Alien meets Laura Croft. Mm -hmm. in this queer, snarky science fiction adventure, okay? Um, when you, so when you use the word queer, what does queer mean to you? And I, and I, and I take this in a way of, because, um, you know, I, I'm a gay man, and I've been mm -hmm. that way all my life, but I'm 59. And so back in the younger days when I was a kid, or just, you know, in the 70s and even the 80s, queer was a very negative word. Yes. And it was always used to put you down type thing. Mm -hmm. And and I remember that. And and so just recently I noticed some of the national magazines and papers kind of using that word and someone actually my accountant actually sent me a note saying, you know, she was totally um upset with this and wrote the editor a letter because they they talked about the queer community and it's like how how what a terrible word to use and I'm thinking, well, it seems to be coming back. Mm -hmm. So could, what, what, how, how would you explain queer? I mean, I, th I think it's one of those words that, you know, has been fairly successfully reclaimed um, for the most part. And for me, I use it, you know, I, I, I use it in broad terms. You know, I wouldn't necessarily use it for a specific individual unless if I knew that they were comfortable with it. Because, you know, there are a lot of people like yourself who are much more familiar with it being used as a, as a slur and as an attack. Um, but I use it for myself because it's a lot easier than listing off all the initials. And a lot of times, you know, I... Exactly. And, you know, I, I might be talking to someone who isn't, you know, that doesn't know what half of those, um, letters stand for. And for myself too, it's, it's easier than, you know, maybe I don't want to disclose all the ways I feel queer um, to, to a random person. Um, and and so I use that because it's, it's more comfortable. But, you know, I, I think a lot of people that I've seen who, who use it for themselves also, you know, it's, it's easier than saying, like, well, I'm this, I'm that. And maybe that definition might change. You know, our, our ideas, especially when it comes to gender, you know, our, our ideas of who we are often do change, you know. And and I think that sort of leaves that that wiggle room. Um, so yeah. yeah, for for me it's that, and it's also it leaves a little bit room for maybe my characters to go on that journey themselves. So it gives you a little bit more fluid. Yeah, it's it, it's a little less specific, um, and and at least when it comes to um, you know broad terms, I think it can be a little bit more inclusive as long as you know you're referring to the right people. Yeah, and that kind of makes sense now that I think about it. I don't have a negative mm -hmm. feeling with the word because, uh, you know, I understand some people use it that way, but it's like it's like fag. It's like a lot of these right. words. I, I, I'm not really into giving power to any of these words. Um, it's really where, where the heart is. It's where people mm -hmm. come from. You know, if someone hates you, they hate you. It doesn't matter. Right. Really, you know, their actions will speak. Uh, louder than any of these words, but I like that idea. That's a good kind of explanation, so people hopefully can understand it better. Does that does that make it more difficult for you as well, writing? Oh, I mean, in of course it does. Um, <laughs> but I I think it also um, maybe and, and and this is maybe a chicken or egg thing. You know, I don't I don't know if it's that writing has helped me explore these things or if I was exploring these things, you know, be before that. Um, but I, I do find myself, as I'm writing different identities, 
you know, I, f- I might find something that fits in a way that I didn't expect it to. And I have to kind of sit back and think, huh, why, why is that? But I think maybe because I'm coming from the perspective of someone who is queer and who has had to explore these things, um, you know, b- before you come out and tell people about it, you, you, you want to be sure you, you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think in some ways it's given me a lot more freedom to explore who I am. And in, I think some people who maybe haven't had that opportunity haven't gotten to like really delve into who they are as a, as a person because they haven't had the excuse to. Um, I think it's great that, you know, that, that I can do that and people should probably do that a little bit more. And writing sort of gives me a sandbox to do that. Um, but you know, of course there's the, the natural, um, flack of like, well, I don't see why you need to include this character, you know, this, this love scene between these, these characters when they probably wouldn't say the same thing about, uh, you know, a, a straight love scene. Right. Well, does that does that worry you in a way as a writer that um, maybe some people will just not give you a chance, just write this off? Oh, well, it's just a queer thing, you know. Right. I mean, yes, but there. I the way I look at it is, you know, I'm not writing for everyone. I'm writing for someone, and I'm I'm writing for maybe a smaller audience than some of the other authors might be. Um, but I would much rather have you know, like a hundred diehard fans whose lives I've really impacted than a hundred thousand, you know, mediocre fans who kind of remember the story, but weren't, you know, deeply, profoundly impacted. Um, and it is a trade-off, but that, that's just how, how I choose to, to go about it. Um, and also, I mean, the, if, if they don't like my work, that's okay. You know, they, they don't have to. Hmm. Do you have so when you you've got this is the the fourth book I believe you said so mm-hmm. um, your doctor Nell Bentley um, how, how how do you decide to have that main character evolve over four books and also do you find it difficult to do that I so I frequently I set out to write a single novel and then it turns into four books or in in the case of of Nell's story it's actually going to be six, um, and I think that's that's almost easier for me. Um, I, I do write short fiction, but not um, you know not to the same degree. And I I really enjoy having the time to like get get into her head, Um, especially, you know, I I try to write complex characters. I try to write characters who are imperfect, who change their minds, who, you know, make bad choices. Um, And she makes, she makes a lot of bad choices. (laughs) Um, And so that, that length um, helps me have the time to do that. And then also, you know, incorporate all the stuff that, that people want, you know, the, the explosions and the, you know, life or death scenes and the electro guns and things like that. Um, But I do, I do really try and get into her head throughout that arc. And, um, you know, she's definitely changed from, she's still hot-headed, but, um, you know, she, she started therapy and she's trying to figure out why she's angry and why she's just angry at everything. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to dump that angry lesbian trope um, on, its, <laughs> on its head and say, like, well, yeah, I mean, t- there's a lot of things to be, like, ticked off about. <laughs> well, yeah. She doesn't throw beer at everybody. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's that's really one of the things I love about writing series is you have that time to to get into these characters, you know, inner workings, and especially with with fantasy where I have multiple point of view characters, you know, I I need that length to to get there. Yeah, yeah, it, it gives you more room, you know, mm-hmm. and and that. So, who who would you go to, or who do you read in in that? type of writing in the sci-fi fantasy and and all that or do you not read any other writers like that oh i definitely do um i'm i sort of had like readers block um over the past few years it was very difficult for me to to pick up books um actually and um you know i was dealing with obviously pandemic and then before that my my dad had just passed and so i was struggling to actually just pick up a book um but I've I've gotten back into the, back into the saddle. Um, I'm currently reading uh, Myra Grant's um, Into the Drowning Deep, which is speculative. It's um, a 
I don't want to give too much away. Yeah. It's a, a journey into the Mariana Trench, um, you know, trying to d- debunk this uh, mockumentary thing um, that actually might have been real. So that's that's been really fun. There's, you know, dark mermaids, and I'm absolutely terrified of water, so it's been really, really scary for me, and I like that. Um, I like scaring myself. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've been reading her, and then I also have been reading a lot of sort of dark romance and gothic romance. Um, I got really into horror during the pandemic, too. I was like, well, let's just let's get all the doom here. Um, so I was <laughs> go reading... Uh, go over the edge. <laughs> exactly. I was reading um, S.T. Gibson. Um, she wrote a really cool retelling of Dracula, speaking of vampires. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of where I've, where I've been. Um, of course, I, I got my start with, with Tolkien and, you know, the, the classics, but I, I think there's a lot of really incredible things being done with some of the newer speculative works. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Do you, do you have a favorite work that you've written? Ooh, um, yes, yes. Um, I really enjoyed writing the last book in my Blood of Titans world, um, which is Blood and Mercy. I went to some kind of strange places with it that I wasn't really anticipating going when I first set out writing it, um, and... I I had a lot of fun kind of playing around with that and where the characters went and the idea of reluctant gods and, you know, this this guy who has this divine divine power and just wants to um, go hang out in the inn with his boyfriend and really have nothing to do with this god business. Um, So that, that was really fun. And I'm really enjoying writing Fugitives, which is the fifth Nell Bentley book. I don't know if it's no. my favorite. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you work uh, archaeology into uh, your novels. Do you have any other hobbies or activities that inform your work that you draw from to create story? I I collect um, natural curiosities, so I have oh, wow. a lot of a lot of bones. Like our house is filled with skulls um, <laughs> of, of various you know non-human animals. There's there's only one human skull, um, <laughs> other than our own that we're using currently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really like biology and death and, <laughs> um, you know, mortuary stuff and, you know, they kind of morbid. Um, so I, I like to incorporate a lot of visceral stuff, um, you know, with, with space and all the things that can happen to the human body in space and with advanced technology um, and then, you know, with fantasy and how magic can change our bodies, um, I, I kind of like to get into the gross part. <laughs> I wonder, you know, do, do you, for, for me, um, when I go back to some of my earliest books, um, I cringe. <laughs> 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 I'm not real excited about it. And when someone says, oh, I love that book, I kind of want to, I have an eye twitch that kind of starts. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't feel that comfortable with my earlier stuff, and I think if I had a chance to write them over again now, I would. Um, do you ever get that feeling too? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, like I, I think I mentioned, you know, before with my first two books, I, I was a bit more reserved with where I was going with them, and I, you know, I, I feel like I could have done them better. And I, I did actually go back. I, I re-released. Um, the, the first one, and I did go back and add a few things, but, you know, of course, it's, it's already out in the world, and the series is already out in the world, so I can't, I couldn't go back completely, you know, go from scratch, but I did, I, I, I did, you know, add a few things and tweak a few things here, nothing, you know, plot, you know, deep plot-wise, but, but definitely some things, and, you know, it, it was nice, but nothing's ever going to be perfect, and, I got a little bogged down in, in that feeling of like that cringe and like I don't want you know some what if someone buys it now what if someone reads my latest book and then goes and buys my backlist and it's like oh well, what's this drivel yeah but I you know I, I I didn't want to I think you can get trapped by that and I've kind of I've tried to switch my mentality to make this the best it can be the best this particular book needs to be for what you're doing right now and then put it to bed and 
you know, if, if you're looking back at it and, and you want to change this, that, and the other thing, just put that in the next the next project that, that you're working on. And that's, that's been helpful, but not easy. <laughs> no. No, I, you know, it's, it's crazy. I, I have people that read the last book and they go, oh, this is great, and they'll send you an email. And it's like, oh, I'd, I'd love to read another one of your books. Which one should I get? And I'm thinking, well, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go back, you know. And I always want to go back to my first one. And it's like, no. <laughs> no. <It's tough. laughs> well, because I just, I, I don't know. I, I, a lot of it's in your own mind, right? You know, yeah. It's not probably as bad as I think, and it's just in my own mind. Um, but anyway. Um, it's, it's hard, though, because, like, with series, I have to go back. I have to remember what I named people and where I left them and who's dead and who's not. And, and so I have to go back and read and... It, you know, I, there are scenes that I'm like, oh, God, really? Like, really? Did you do that? Come on now. Um, um, but I I also have been kind of pleasantly surprised with a few scenes. Like, actually, this isn't terrible. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, usually it isn't. I think for, for me, I think it's just the way you write, you know, mm-hmm. like your phrasing and some of the – some and how you put it together. It, it, gets better each time you do a book and you go further into your life so when you go back um, several books you realize that you didn't have the experience putting it together so it would be like reshaping something you had written you know right so it, you know like I said it's just I'm, I'm a little bit nut, nut, nutty anyway right? <laughs> <laughs> just, that's my own problem so that's a different story that's a whole other hour um, we'll call Dr. Phil <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It's a little funny to say. <laughs> um, so how do you like to be contacted by your fans or readers and stuff? Do you have a website or do you have um, something that people can come and give you really bad feedback? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd prefer not the really bad feedback, but I do like to know what people liked, um, what they want to see more of. It's a nice way to phrase it. Um, yeah, I, I have a, a website, vsholmes.com, and uh, I'm on Twitter and Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest, so people can, you know, come follow me on there and see some sneak peeks and stuff like that. Um, I also, on, on my website, I have a place where you can download um, Disciples, which is a prequel to the first Nell Bentley book, and also The Tempest, which is a, so, sort of a prequel. It's set in the same world as my epic fantasy, and you can download those to see if my stuff is up your alley. Well, there you go. It better be a dark alley, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not a... Content warning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, so that that's interesting. So you, you mentioned the pandemic and a few things. So this last year, year and a half, you know, it's, it's, it's been kind, kind of a crazier, twisted time you know Mm -hmm. you know the donald trump stuff and all that thing and uh the pandemic and cops shooting blacks Mm -hmm. just everything going on and that does that change your writing or does that affect how you write oh yes um this this past I'm, i'm gonna say the past two years um because we were barely out of like the grief hole of losing my dad when the pandemic hit Mm -hmm. and it 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 broke me it it utterly broke me um and i went from being a hardcore outliner plotter control freak (laughs) (laughs) to being completely unable to write i actually had to start heretics almost over from scratch um you know with like a super close deadline looming um because i i couldn't use what i'd written and I realized that while I, I do thrive on structure, um, I was looking for structure in the wrong place, and I was putting it in, in my work where I really needed to have that initial sandbox creativity flow of just dumping scenes and seeing you know what, what scenes I liked the best and what scenes fit the best. Um, and so, yeah, it, it completely almost 180'd my, my entire process. And I'm writing more, faster, and better than I ever have, um, which has been really, really nice um, in in a lot of ways. But I don't know if uh, 
I, I, I would have liked to have it be a little easier way to discover that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wonder. I just wonder because when dark things are happening to you, um, it, it seeps into your writing, I guess, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a reason why the novels that I've published in the past two years and, and written in, you know, are definitely my most honest, um, you know, about who, who humans are and who I would like humans to be. And maybe I'm a little scared that humans are. <laughs> humans are terrible. Yeah, but humans get, are Get a pet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's why I have a dog, not a kid. Yeah, I have dogs. Dave has a cat. You know, it's, yep. it's, it's the pets are, you know, I think the pets, why they're so good, it's because they're living now and and today, and their mind mm-hmm. is there, and they bring you back to earth no matter what's going on in your life. Oh, for sure. You for know, sure. there's like a, it's a grounding that they're there. You could sit there with your dog or cat and just kind of go, wow, because it's just now. It's the interaction you're having with them at that moment, and that's all that matters. And I think that's the key key beauty in an animal um, that us humans a lot of times don't live with. You know, mm-hmm. you know. That's yeah. That's that's definitely true. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy, but <laughs> it's all right. We've got to stay happy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. Happy. <laughs> well, it's certainly been interesting. So what's next for you? Uh, you've got Heretex coming out here. Um, and I know as a writer, when I've got a book coming out, quite often I'm already on something else. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so I guess I would imagine you're the same then. What? Yeah. I mean, I, I already don't know what month it is, like between the pandemic, but also like <laughs> yeah. focusing on, I, I thought it was May already. And it's like, no, that's just because everything I'm doing is going to happen in May. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've got Heretics coming out on May 8th. And um, then I'm already halfway through Fugitives, uh, book five. And that'll be coming out um, October 5th of this year. And then just just one more, one more left in in Nell's story arc. Uh, But I'm also sort of switching a little bit um, over to, I'm returning to my fantasy world, but in a, you know, totally new series, different characters, you know, maybe a few cameos, but but otherwise fairly unrelated. Um, And yeah, I'm I'm planning four books, um, sort of returning to that. And I've also got a kind of weird standalone back to like the, dark death necromancy but maybe make it sexy um <laughs> kind of thing that i'm that i'm working on as well that i i don't know what that's going to turn into wow. it's my sandbox project so so you're kind of taking vacation then you're not really <laughs> <out. laughs> not much going yeah. on only yeah. on, only three yeah. things i'm writing yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> wow to live so easy um <laughs> well it's been a uh, great great interview great hour and um our guest has been the author of Heretics, the new book coming out here in May, and that is V.S. Holmes. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Great conversation. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Wave Media.